Welcome to section 3, Virtual and Private Clouds. In this section, we will cover the fundamentals of VPCs. We will learn how to build our own custom VPC hands-on in the console. We will learn about NAT instances, NAT gateways, and private VPC subnets. We will learn about network ACLs, as well as NAT and Bastion hosts. We will look at VPC flow logs. VPC peering connections, how to clean up our VPC that we won't create as part of this exercise, and how we could potentially integrate a VPC with on-premise networks. We will conclude by having a VPC summary validate the knowledge gained in the section. Introduction to Virtual and Private Clouds, VPCs. In this video, we will get an overview of the Virtual and Private Cloud, as well as the default Virtual and Private Cloud, and the main components. What is a VPC? A VPC is a virtual network that closely resembles the traditional private data center with the benefits of using the AWS scalable infrastructure. It is logically isolated from other virtual networks in the cloud, and you can launch your AWS resources within your VPC. You can actually create a VPN connection between your on-premise data center and your VPC to extend your network and thus create a hybrid type of cloud. You have complete control over your virtual networking environment, including selection of your own IP address range, creation of subnets and configuration of root tables and network gateways. We're going to dive in deeper of, about what each of these means later on in this section. One VPC is going to be part of one region, so you can only launch a VPC within one region and can't span multiple regions. But a VPC, once launched in a region, it can span multiple availability zones in that particular region. The VPC service is free to use, but you will have to pay for resources that are deployed within your VPC, including VPN connection hours. So if you're using connection between your on-premise data center and your AWS VPC, as well as NAT gateways, we're going to dive in deeper into what these means later on. It provides advanced security features, for example, security groups and network access control lists to enable inbound and outbound filtering at the instance level and the subnet level. Some use cases for using a VPC include hosting simple public websites, hosting multi-tier applications. For example, you want to traffic from the internet to be able to be routed to your web server, but you don't want your databases or application servers to be accessible from via the internet. You want those to be accessible only via private connections. You can do that using a VPC. Also for hosting scalable web applications in the cloud that are connected to your data center. So think about this as a hybrid approach. Also, you can extend your on-premise network into the cloud, and you can think about using VPCs for disaster recovery. So if one of the regions goes down, or one of the availability zones goes down, you can have different implementation of the same infrastructure deployed in somewhere else. When we create a new VPC, we have to specify a range of IPv4 addresses for the VPC in the form of a classless interdomain routing or CIDR block. For example, we can take 10.0.0.0 slash 16. AWS recommend you specify a CIDR block from the private IPv4 ranges. These are from 10.0.0.0 to 10.255.255.255. Or you can choose 172.16.0.0 up until 172.31.255.255 and 192.168.0.0 to 192.168.255.255 and you can see we have 10 slash 8 prefix 
.16-12 prefix or 192.168-16 prefix. AWS recommend that you specify one of these cider blocks from these ranges, but you can also go and have a public IPv4 range if you want to, but they recommend you use the private ones. When you create a VPC, that will be associated to one CIDR block. That is, you can only have one CIDR block associated with one VPC. The allowed block size is between a slash 16 netmask and a slash 20 netmask. That is, from 16 up until 65,536 IP addresses. How do we know this? We, If you remember, an IPv4 address is 32 bits, and if we use a slash 16 NADMASK, it means that we're going to allow the first 16 bits of the address to stay the same, and we can vary the last 16 bits of the address, so we can change the address, but the first 16 bits are going to be set in for every single address that we're going to use. And with slash 28 netmask, it's going to be the first 28 bits are going to be set. We can't modify those, but the last four bits can be changed. So that's how we're going to end up with 16 addresses for the slash 28 because we're going to have four different bits that we can vary. So we have 16 different possibilities. We can associate a single IPv6 CIDR block with an existing VPC or when we create a new VPC. The CIDR block uses a fixed prefix length of slash 56 and you cannot choose the range of addresses of the IPv6 CIDR block size. AWS assigned the block to your VPC from their pool of IPv6 addresses. What you need to know over here is that you are allowed to use IPv6 CIDR blocks if you want to, but you will also have to specify an IPv4 CIDR block because otherwise your VPC will not be able to function. And once you have assigned a once you have specified the size of your VPC, you cannot modify it. To actually uh, extend your VPC per se, you would need to create a new VPC and then move all your resources to the new VPC. For example, you can use an AMI that you could send to your new VPC and create instances from that AMI. That is one example. But now let's go and actually explore a bit more of what a VPC would look like and its main components. A subnet is a range of IP addresses in your VPC. So if we have chosen a CIDR block range for our VPC, we can actually specify a subset of that CIDR block and assign it to a new subnet. And we're going to see how this is going to work in practice later on, but you just have to know that a subnet is going to be a sub-range of your VPC addresses. You can use a public subnet for resources that must be connected to the internet, and a private subnet for resources that won't be connected to the internet. A subnet must reside entirely within one availability zone, and a subnet cannot span availability zones. We have said before that a VPC can span a region, that is, it can span multiple availability zones within a region, but a subnet is only going to be dedicated to one availability zone. A subnet cannot span multiple availability zones. By default, all subnets within a VPC can route traffic to one another. The first four IP addresses and the last IP address in each subnet CIDR block are not allowed to be used by the end user. These four IP addresses and the last IP address in total making five IP addresses are going to be reserved by AWS and they represent network address, VPC router address, DNS server address, as well as an address for future use and the last address means the network broadcast address. 
So whenever you're going to assign a CIDR block to a new subnet, you have to remember that you cannot use five of those addresses and take that into account when you cal calculate the size of your subnet. A subnet must be associated with a root table, that is a table which specifies the allowed routes for outbound traffic leaving the subnet. We are going to see a few examples of what a root table looks like in practice when we're going to go hands-on. Newly created subnets are automatically associated with the main root table from the VPC. So there is going to be a main root table associated with the VPC, but we can create different root tables and associate it with our subnets. And we're going to see that when we're going to go hands-on with our VPC. Then there is the Internet Gateway, which is a horizontally scaled, redundant, and highly available VPC component that allows communication between instances in your VPC and the Internet. Thus, because this is going to be managed by AWS, you won't have any availability risks or bandwidth constraints on your network traffic imposed by AWS. If you're going to use an Internet Gateway, and uh, you want your subnet traffic to be routed via an internet gateway, that subnet is going to be considered to be a public subnet. If a subnet traffic is not routed to an internet gateway, it's going to be a private subnet. And we're going to see how this is going to work in practice. You can have a maximum of one internet gateway per VPC. That is, you can only associate one internet gateway to your VPC. You can't have multiple internet gateways to the same VPC. Then two other concepts that we need to understand before we dive in any deeper are network access control lists or ACLs, which act as a firewall for associated subnets, controlling both inbound and outbound traffic at the subnet level and security groups, which act as a firewall for associated Amazon EC2 instances, controlling both inbound and outbound traffic at the instance level. Let's try to visualize the concepts that we have just learned. Let's say that we have a use case for a web server to be present, or multiple web servers to be present within a VPC, and we want our clients to connect via the internet to our web servers. But at the same time, that application itself, we want to have some EC2 instances that are going to crunch some numbers for us, and we want those instances to be doing their tasks for this application without them being able to be accessed via the internet. So we only want them to be accessed via the instances that are within our VPC. So let's see how we can do that. Let's suppose we have a user who is going to connect via the internet, and we have a VPC that is defined in a region. So we have this region, and we define the VPC, and our VPC is going to span two different availability zones, so availability zone 1 and availability zone 2. We are going to attach an internet gateway to our VPC to allow internet connectivity from the outside. And as we remember, there is only one internet gateway that can be attached to a VPC. We cannot attach more than one. And to make our subnet 1 and subnet 2 public, we are going to attach root in our routing table to this internet gateway. So we can allow traffic from our internet gateway to go to our instances. And what is going to happen over here is that, let's say that our user's request is going to be routed via the internet. The internet gateway is going to pick up this traffic and is going to route into, let's say, public subnet 1. What is going to happen over here is that once it has got to this routing table of our subnet 1, it's going to redirect the traffic to our instance, but first it's going to look at the network ACL and see, is the subnet allowed to actually route this type of traffic 
uh, be allowed to be rooted to our subnet? If yes, then let's go to our subnet, which is public subnet 1. Then from here, it's going to be rooted to our security group, which is attached to our EC2 instance. And that security group specifies, is this instance actually allowed to have this particular type of traffic added to it or transmitted to it? If yes, then we can proceed. So let's say that our EC2 instance has received the request and is now doing the processing of that particular request. And let's suppose that this request involves some number crunching. But how is this EC2 instance going to be able to communicate with this EC2 instance that is in a private subnet? Because this private subnet does not have a, a link to our internet gateway. We haven't added it into its root table. Luckily, because we specified that that these subnets are going to be part of the same VPC. We can see that a um, local root is going to be added between all of the um, subnets. That is, all of the routing tables are going to have a way for each of the subnets to communicate with one another, and that is every single instance that is in a subnet can communicate with all the other instances, no matter if they're in a public or a private subnet. And so because this EC2 instance can communicate with this other EC2 instance, which is in a private subnet, because the root tables are allowed to use the local traffic, this means that the request can be directed to our security group from this EC2 instance. And from there on, it can be written to our EC2 instance that can do the number crunching and deliver the response back to our previous EC2 instance. And based on that, the result of the number crunching and then the R request that the user added in, whatever the result is can be returned back to our user by uh, the instance in the public subnet. And that is the main idea about how VPCs work with an internet gateway. And as we can see over here, the same functionality is allowed in availability zone 2. We can have different types of architecture, but the same idea applies. Once that root table is going to find where it can actually root, the traffic to, the traffic is going to be routed to the public EC2 instance to get the request. And then if this one needs to interact with any other EC2 instances or our resources that are in the private subnet, because it has that local traffic rule within its root table, it can actually pass that information on to the EC2 instances or the other resources and communicate with them and then retrieve the results. The last part is going to be on default VPCs. A default VPC is the VPC that is pre-configured by default in your AWS account. This is a VPC that is ready to use and we have been using it throughout our course, for example, using EC2 instances, when we created them, we launched them in the default VPC. The VPC size of the default VPC is slash 16 IPv4 CIDR block. By default, the default VPC is going to have one default subnet created per availability zone within the region that the VPC is deployed in. And we have one internet gateway is going to be connected to the default VPC. And all subnets in the default VPC are public and are associated with the main root table with a rule that sends all internet traffic to the internet gateway. Instances launched into a default subnet receive both a public IPv4 address and a private IPv4 address. Instances in a default subnet 
also receive both public and private DNS host names. A default security group is created and associated with our default VPC, as well as a network access control list or ACL is created and associated with the default VPC. Then there is a default DHCP or dynamic host configuration protocol options set for our AWS account is associated with our default VPC. And this means that the default DHCP option set specifies the Amazon provided DNS. We're going to use an Amazon provided DNS for our to for the instances or the resources. If the default VPC is deleted, the only way to get it back or to retrieve it is by contacting AWS. There is no other way to retrieve that default VPC, so it's best practice not to delete it. 